Okay, guys, it's 6.35. Welcome. Welcome to Seminar C, the Reconciliation Series um, with Ajax. Um, before I do start, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land that I'm currently on. I'm here in Ball and Q on the land of the Rundry people. I pay respect to their elders past, present and emerging. And I'd like to extend that to the lands that you're currently on as well and pay respect to elders past and present. But I would also like to take that an extra step to the lands where you may have grown up on which might be somewhere completely different than you are now. And I pay respect to your own elders past and present because they helped shape you to who you became today. Before I introduce our guest speaker, I'm going to do something that I don't normally do, but I will do it. I want you to have a little bit of a chat with um, yourself, with, with each other for a second, just to introduce yourself. So I might need Alex back on because Alex, is Alex there? Yes, hello. Can you do me a favour and just create like six breakout rooms for five minutes so people can go and say hello sure. to each other? Thing. Uh, <clears throat> how many breakout rooms, sorry? Six rooms and give people five minutes or so just to go and introduce yourself to some people you may not have met before. Oh, my goodness. Would you believe that I've completely forgot how Zoom functions? Give me one <laughs> second. Um, <laughs> I thought I could do it, but I don't have room, breakout rooms on my thing. Should be right down the bottom. It should say breakout rooms. Nicole, you might be able to see it if you've got control, but you might not either. No, this is quite strange. Where it normally is isn't actually here right now, AG. Okay. Um, Maybe I don't know that. why that's happening. I was going to do an activity. Um, so have sorry, you, um, give me, I might be able to find it. It might be because I'm recording. Are you sometimes just, sometimes you need to set up a breakout room facility before you yeah, before set up a Zoom meeting. Uh, so I might be restricted to what we've already started doing, I'm afraid. No problem. No problem, guys. So Sorry, everybody. Please stick some information in the chat about where you are today, what land you're on, who you are, where you are from, just so we can get a little bit of, to know you as we're going along. Hmm. Tonight, we've got a wonderful speaker coming in, um, zooming in from Wurundjeri land down here in Melbourne. Um, it is Nicole Finlay, who is the CEO of Reconciliation Victoria. Um, I'm lucky enough to have known Nicole for about 10 years and have seen her progress, whoa, well, to become CEO of Reconciliation um, uh, Victoria. And I'm sure she'll explain her journey along the way. Yeah. Um, I will hand straight over to her. She'll actually just tell you a little bit about what she's talking about, but how she might want to run this session as well, because I think she's happy for you to ask questions as we're going along, or we, you can stick them in the chat and Alex and I will um, stop every now and then. But without further ado, I'm going to throw you over to Nicole. Thank you, AJ, and thank you very much for that beautiful welcome and acknowledgement. Acknowledgement, and I'd also like to acknowledge that I'm joining you this evening on Wurundjeri Woiwurrung Country. I grew up um, on Wurundjeri Woiwurrung Country and have lived here for the best part of my 40 plus, getting to grow, getting to 50 years and uh, being safe and nurtured with the guidance of elders, aunties, uncles. Uh, and I'd say like brothers and sisters, I feel like I'm very much part of um, the community here on NAM and also have felt, um, have worked all over the country with uh, First Peoples, um, had the privilege of working in Aboriginal employment space for 20 odd years. And um, I guess, and I'd also just like to acknowledge the, the work and the, the strong work and efforts that uh, AJ has been making and progress over the years, his impact, his indirect and direct impact that he continues to have um, amongst and for his people. And uh, I'd just like to acknowledge your work, um, AJ. I have uh, much respect for you. Um, it is uh, a 24-7 um, a, a gig that you continue to give love and blood and um, just keep giving. And we've all been in this uh, space for a long time, but then you have you live it every day and so do community. And um, 
there's a lot of overdue work and uh, a lot of us have been patiently waiting and walking alongside for many years. So I really value the opportunity tonight to, to talk and, um, you know, have this invitation to share more about the work that Reconciliation Victoria does in the community. We've only been around, I guess, a fairly short space of time, 20 years um, in the space. So we're, start, we're celebrating that, type, that milestone um, this year. But I would also like to extend my I respect to any other First Peoples that are joining us also today, um, this evening. And I just, I'd also like to just say a, a very special thank you for reconciliation advocates, champions who um, walk alongside in, in this space and, and do, um, you know, a great deal of work in their communities, with their families and in their workplaces every day too. So I think it is important that we all, we do all, um, respectfully you know know that we are walking in this safe space together so I just I do want to talk a little bit into and take you into the journey of reconciliation Victoria because you know we we did start out 20 years ago but in this landscape already we had um, micro local reconciliation network groups which have been around even longer than um, reconciliation Victoria and we actually have 29 um, local rec groups across the state who you know have been waiting patiently have watched the reconciliation movement and some say it stemmed from the 1960s and then others say you no know, definitively it came out of you know 1991 out of the formal movement of the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody report so um, that's where Reconciliation Australia puts its stake in the stand and says that's when the movement started but Many, us, many of us also are looking to First Peoples languages to understand where, you know, well-meaning white settlers might have engaged with First Peoples really, really early from settlement and maybe understanding if there was a, a reconciliation story that's even deeper that we don't know, but that we could discover through First Peoples languages. We just certainly know that amongst the um, Wurundjeri Woiwurrung um, head tribes, tribesmen, the Narangida, the chiefs, they had a word for uh, non-Indigenous, uh, well-meaning white settlers, and that word was Namaji. And so we're exploring um, these words. We know that with um, the um, Gundijamara, they also have a word called Muji, which is special friend. So we're, we're exploring this and we're trying to understand it a little, little bit more. And we think with treaty advancements, advancement now, you know, in process and in progress with the treaty advancement in Victoria that um, we really have an opportunity to understand, you know, traditional boundaries, traditional stories and find out a lot more about this potential, um, you know, love stories, friendships, these kind of healing stories that may have travelled out of our Un our unfortunate past as well that we can't overlook that real truth telling where um you know we will never be able to get away from you know the true fabric of how we were founded but we will certainly be able to look for some of those healing stories and that will be um that will be our role as treaty advancement um you know continues and we hope that reconciliation supporters will stay with us in this conversation to explore that more as educators yourselves you you will probably start to find these stories and hear these stories or, or probably already are and we, we welcome those stories to be shared with us, us as well if you hear them um, share them more broadly so that's I guess tapping into a little bit about um you know, what does Rec Vic do? And I guess, you know, you will find us on social media a lot these days. We get out and about as much as we could over COVID. We've really strengthened our communication. We spend a lot of time doing speaking engagements in schools or in various workplaces. We work really, really closely with local governments across the state. So I guess with local governments, 79 local governments across the, across the state, we um, work on RAP development with them. Some um, local councils also have just um, developed their own reconciliation strategies that aren't the endorsed Reconciliation Australia models. And some of those great strategies are being led by traditional owners themselves. And the other interesting thing that's coming into our local government landscape 
um, is that um, as of the 24th of March this year, the launch of the Victorian Aboriginal and Local Government Strategy was launched. What we're going to see in Victoria alongside treaty advancement, alongside the um, Truth Telling Commission, we are also going to see self-determination local action plans being developed for the next five years between traditional owners, First Peoples who live in uh, municipalities and shires at, alongside local governments. These um, self-determination local action plans will be um, developed through the lens of this Victorian Aboriginal and Local Government Strategy five-year plan. And it also means that there'll be an annual reporting process where local governments will report to an Aboriginal caucus about their progress that they're making with self-determination local action plans. We think this is a really, really exciting proposition because we know the influence that local governments have, the interactions they have with all um, areas of our life from early years maternal health uh, health services all the way up um, to the older, you know, to the elders in our community. We understand the impact and influence they have. We work closely with local governments, but these self-determination local action plans are new. And when we know that somebody like Gough Whitlam back in the 70s put um, self-determination policies in our landscape back in the 70s, we've it's taken this long for us to see now at a state level and a local government level, self-determination is really being threaded and embedded into our local government policies and frameworks. And we're really, really excited about it. So we would um, invite you, if you're already engaged with your local councils or not, just to some of you I know may well be um, managed or not managed, but certainly um, might have an operational connection with your local council already. So we we'd invite you to ask your local councils about these um, self-determination local action plans. Some, the response we're actually seeing amongst local governments at the moment is their reaction has been, oh, we better get a wrap because we actually haven't done a lot of this foundation work. So there's a bit of this sort of, you know, run, 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 we better do something, we better get a wrap on the table because the self-determination local action plans have been designed in partnership with Aboriginal leaders across Victoria and Aboriginal workers in services and local and, and local government. So it's a really progressive model. And um, again, something that if you are developing reconciliation action plans in your own workplace, how might you thread some of the measurements that are within those self-determination local action plans. There's seven key pillars in um, those self-determination local action plans. How might you thread that into the governance of your reconciliation action plans and your outcomes? So at the moment, we know with the Reconciliation Australia model, there's three key themes, respect, relationships and opportunities. But you know, looking at the self-determination local action plans, having those the, the seven pillars that are in there, it also um, very much integrates the 11 self-determination principles of the Victorian Aboriginal Affairs framework into that um, action plan as well. So we're just encouraging RAP orgs in Vic Victoria, RAP organisations to really start thinking about these other really progressive plans that are coming into our landscape. Because one thing we learnt, we were up at the um, Reconciliation Australia's uh, national conference um, two weeks ago, and all eyes are really on Victoria. Um, the, the father of uh, Reconciliation, Senator Dodson, was up there presenting, and he said, you know, um, one thing that we, we you know, with all... Uh, Obviously, with a new government in, um, we saw the Fed, the new federal affair, um, Aboriginal Affairs Minister Linda Burney was there, and and everybody was just so hopeful, so hopeful that change with you know full support of for the um, Uluru Statement from the heart. What will this look like? And I guess where um, the conversations quickly go is there's there's some real 
uh, keen eyes on what has Victoria been doing. We've been such a progressive state in so many ways in putting, making inroads and treaty, getting treaty advancement with the First Peoples Assembly of Victoria, with um, the Truth Telling Commission. These are things that that haven't um, even begun in other states. So there is, you know, some work that's being done in Queensland at the moment. We we saw um, Jackie Huggins recently uh, speak at the launch of the Navigation Practice Centre, which has been launched at Swinburne University in Victoria. And another thing happening in Victoria, just right there to sort of say, you know, that, and this is why a lot of, um, you know, the state reconciliation bodies around uh, the country, you know, Rec WA, Rec New South Wales, Rec South Australia are all looking towards Victoria and saying, wow, you know, how, how have they managed to do all of this? So how have they managed to put all of these policies in place? And what we will say is we have exceptionally strong Aboriginal leaders in Victoria and we have, a, we have really opened up through really strong leadership that opportunity for shared decision-making um, to take place. And essentially um, that's what self-determination offers us is that shared decision-making process to unfold. And so we're, we're really excited about these developments in at Rec Vic. Um, I know it sounds a bit sort of policy and, and politically uh, oriented at the moment, some of these conversations, but they, they really are. We're heading for, we've been waiting a very, very long time for constitutional recognition um, to be uh, in place in this country. And um, we see it. We see it on the horizons and we, Reconciliation Victoria is led by a First Peoples Cultural Council. We have great elders and aunties um, uh, in, our, uh, in, in the council and uncles like Uncle Jim Berg, Gundi Jamara, elder, 84 years of age, 50 years. He was one of the founding members of the Koori Heritage Trust in Victoria and has worked in the Koori court systems for 50 years. And, you know, we, we, we want to see this happen in Uncle Jim's lifetime. And um, I'm going to get emotional because these people, are, uh, you know, are and they, they offer us so much guidance and wisdom in the work that we do. Um, everything that Reconciliation Victoria does is about facilitating and elevating voice um, and strengthening relationships with First Peoples. Everything that we do is through relationships to ensure that uh, First Peoples' voice is heard and constitutional recognition is achieved and justice is achieved. So we are... Um, in this journey, we're in it really deep at the moment and we're following um, the political developments really closely. Um, one thing that we're about to, um, two major projects that I'm really excited to share with you and I'd love your, I'd love your input if you're um, a strong supporter and feel as passionate as we do about all of these things. We're about to run um, and everyone's going to go, oh, not a state, another statewide survey, but we are putting the RecVic measuring stick out for the first time in 20 years. We have never asked the state of Victoria or um, about community attitudes towards reconciliation. We actually don't even know where that measuring stick is. We don't know if people are going to be left behind in this, if a referendum is called. We don't know who is engaged and who isn't because that, re that measuring stick has never been put out there. And Senator Dodson said the one thing he wants to hear right now is that he wants to hear about those people that um, are are potentially opposed to this and why are they opposed to it? We want to be hearing that voice. We, they don't want to be crawling over the line at 51%. We want everybody to be engaged and know that we are going to get um, it, it, all of those that are engaged and, and we, that we can get engaged. We want 99% and more, 99.9% .9 if we can. So not leaving anyone behind in this conversation and in this, if the referendum is, is called. So a rec big measuring stick will be a statewide survey that we put out to all of our stakeholders and we'll be asking, please, it won't, it won't be going to anyone under 18. So it will be going, you know, to our key stakeholders who are, 
um, in the over 18. We're working with Aboriginal researchers from La Trobe and Swinburne Uni to support us in the development of that. And um, we will also be having a RecVic measuring, uh, not a measuring stick, a uh, membership platform, which will be launched in August. And this will enable you to keep really closely across our resources. Um, so we'll have member only resources. If you've wanted that RecVic sticker, that uh, mug, that t-shirt, that hat for all these years, that hoodie, it will be coming to you. Finally, you will be visible at the marches. <laughs> And I've, I've come from community uh, radio background, so I love all that. I'm a, a full subscriber to wanting to be visible to the things that I'm, a, I'm passionate about. And if you are too, we're going to be opening that up for um, all rec supporters across the state to be part of that. So it'll be affordable and accessible for everybody. Um, and then I might just take a breath here, see if there's any questions <laughs> at the moment. Any questions from anybody at this particular moment? Nicole goes, oh, my God, I don't know if I can talk for half an hour. <laughs> <laughs> and you're halfway through. You got, you're doing really well. Awesome. I don't want to put people to sleep. I know it's Monday. And uh, but this, there's just, I'd just be curious to know where people are at um, in their, their rap journey um, and or I can sort of, I can start dipping into a little bit of that area about how we support rap organisations if that's and maybe we can get some questions that way. What about if I ask a question people just put into the chat who has started a rap and who hasn't started a rap? I don't know if you can see. I can't see the questions, AJ, so. There is no question. Okay. I just said stick it in the, stick, can, you, can you see the chat at all? Yeah, I, I feel I'll, like. <laughs> that's great. Well, thank you. And, and that's right. You might be in an organisation that you feel like you're on a constant, in, you know, on a constant wrap, as long as it feels like you're getting somewhere. One thing we do say to organisations is to, I guess, do that constant uh, cultural self-reflection work and whether that's um, just doing a little bit of a mini survey I have a staff of like three people and I even survey my staff about where is their cultural learning journey at where is their cult cultural self-reflection um, at and so that just enables us to to ask and, and take a little bit of responsibility for our own um, cultural learning. So coming into my role, I immediately put a cultural book library in place and said, look, just as a basic PDP, I want you all to read, you know, take a book from the library every three months and, you know, tell us a little bit about um, the book that you're reading. And I'm, you know, deeply in reading Truth Telling um, by Henry Reynolds at the moment. I'm just going to give that a plug. If you haven't read it, it's a great book. <laughs> It's a great read. Um, and so, you know, just seeing what small things that you can do with that cultural learning, but in doing that assessment of um, your cultural learning journey for your organisation, just appreciating that everybody in your workplace will be at a level some people will have great lived experience might have been on country somewhere someone might be, you know, married, you know, be part of the mob you know they have family connections and everything like that and then others may just be you know as um, Marie you shared just you know getting past you know things that might be set around their table that feel a bit racist and they don't like that and they're just starting to dip their toe in and and say I don't want that in my um, circle anymore um, so you know it's about having that that bit of that self-assessment and that self-reflection. So one thing that um, RecVic does is we support organisations as well on um, how to do that bit of cultural, cultural self-reflection um, assessment. So it could be, it's like a little 20 minute survey that you just put out to your workforce. And um, it really does also ask about what, what appetite do your staff actually have um, in supporting a wrap as well. So some people also have, um, 
no interest or they simply don't really know the purpose of what a wrap is all about. And that's okay too. So putting those questions in there, inviting um, staff to also ma making sure that if you are developing this um, self-reflection assessment, giving some options about how people want um, their, their training delivered, about also um, engaging with Aboriginal experts like uh, um, AJ on, you know, to be able to provide all the different types of Aboriginal um, cultural training that are out there as well, because if you just fly the question to staff, oh, what sort of cult cultural training would you like? They often think, well, I don't know what's out there, so I don't really know what I should be doing. Um, and then uh, I'll thank you for all the book recommendations <laughs> that are coming through, you know, and, and that's great. And just being in that really safe circle of being able to share the other thing that can come up with cultural self-reflection assessment if you do it on an annual basis the other thing it does it helps you measure the success of your training as well so you can see that if you um, are running the survey each year and you know staff have done you know training with AJ then they're able to say you know that next in that next survey the following year oh we did this and it was great or you can you'll be able to see where you know the progress has actually taken place as well so um, you know, we, we measure so many things in our workforce, but we don't actually measure our own um, cultural learning journey. And many of you are, um, you know, so privileged to be at that, you know, really formative early stages of supporting the cultural learning journey for young ones and, and their families are part of that journey as well. And then, you know, coming from the Aboriginal employment space, um, I see such benefit in getting that early formative years of, of supporting a really healthy cultural learning journey right from the ground up because it heads into primary, secondary, tertiary, and then into the workplace because so much of, you know, where cultural safety actually exists for so many is actually in the workplace. So that's why, you know, I'm, I'm really um, so supportive and wanting to see that, that great work that's done in the early and the formative years. Um, the other thing that the other thing that we sort of ask in in this journey as well in that cultural self reflection is that organisations make that investment and actually really you know take it very you know seriously as 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 they do with all their other training is to make that proper investment in in the rap space is probably one of the real um, key under investments that we see or if organisations are making that investment they're not making the investment with any evidence base underneath them so they're just randomly saying oh you know we uh, we think our, our staff need this so and we've met this great trainer so let's just give them this this particular training and I've I've had you know health services and hospitals contact me and say that we did that we didn't do any assessment of our staff where their training was at and we gave them some training and then half of our staff ended up in EAP because the, the training landed really, really badly. So we, we kind of, we do need to do that assessment for many reasons. Um, and I'm just seeing all the... <laughs> bits of comments coming through which is great thank you so so that's one one part of getting on to your your rap journey and then I think where we we touched also a no little questions. jump in yeah jump in AJ I know a couple of questions what it's come up a couple, a couple of private ones to me and someone else just now hmm. it's about pe people also wanting to connect with Aboriginal elders yeah. Can you make a comment on that? Yeah, I mean I can, and you probably have said this numerous times. So I don't I don't really want to speak on your behalf or on behalf of another community member, but engaging with um elders and, and traditional owners. So um I, I think this is an important thing because when I start on um developing a rap, I, I take an approach which I think is really important, and that starts with an uh, informing the traditional owners at the beginning of the journey so we we go in and have uh, information about information sharing and we're, we're able to almost start that conversation about who are we what is our intention and what is our what is our vision for reconciliation why do we want to do this but you might be in an organization that operates across lots of different traditional owner, owner boundaries so that that could also be a complicated process for you so you may just need to in the first instance 
provide information of your intention to be developing a wrap with those respect, respective traditional owners. And then if we're talking about elders, then the next stage of, of um, wrap consultation we go into is looking at all um, First Nations that may be in the footprint of your organisation that you may be engaged with. So um, it's a tricky one. A lot of uh, people feel like um, when they're developing their rap that they have to go out and go, oh, we, you know, we've got to have hundreds and hundreds of people, uh, you know, First Peoples across our rap and they've got to all be at the table. And it's, it, that's that's not what this is about it's about your organization's relationships and just strengthening those relationships and having quality meaningful long-term relationships in there so um i always sort of think well if you've got um aboriginal staff who are already working with your aboriginal families start where you're at you know start where you're at if the relationships are there then then just strengthening those relationships and then you know the more that you strengthen those relationships more community will come around and into your project projects and into your your rap and what will want to be supported but um I, that i just feel that we always need to be really really respectful when we're engaging with um, first peoples just because of their heavy commitment that they have through family, through um, so many of their other committees that um, they may already be working on or the projects that they're working on. So it's just having a really, I guess, a, a level of awareness about what works um, for the community members who are wanting to work alongside your organisation. So there'll be, for, for us, if, if we have those close relationships with um, aunts and uncles and that, so often, you know, if an uncle wants to drop in and have a cuppa with us, you know, we pretty much drop everything and we'll sit down with that uncle or aunt and spend, you know, half an hour having a cuppa. But they're very personal relationships as well like we're, we're you know we we exchange biscuits and we exchange you know we do all all sorts of you know very very me have meaningful time with each other um and so yeah it's it's, it's I don't think we can sort of say if, if you wanted to have, take a really coordinated and a, a, a putting a process behind your engagement with First Peoples. Local governments do a lot of this and it, it's through the lens of having like an Aboriginal advisory committee. And then you might have, you know, a terms of reference, which the committee then puts in place you know, alongside you, that you you shape that terms of reference that um, and and not adopting the same terms of reference that you have for your other committee over here, allowing the um, the elders or the the first peoples that are around that committee to to support you to shape that terms of reference and also to determine whether a sitting fee will be um, provided to those members for coming around the table um, when those meetings, what, what the sort of um, frequency of those meetings will be. Um, and so an advisory committee might be something that you you want to do it in more of a, a formal uh, a formal way your engagement you can do that so I've talked about TO engagement I've talked about first peoples the other step of engagement which is really critical in your rap development is your staff engagement so once you have your wish lists from um, your first peoples partners and from your traditional owner partners if they're in, engaged already in your rap development then it's coming to staff and saying you know how do you think we can service how do you how do you think we can meet the aspirations or um, the, this wish list? And then from there, that's when you start to shape and develop your deliverables. A lot of organisations go about you know thinking, oh, we have to draft this wrap, and we just we've got all these great ideas, and we'll just put them all together, and then they take their draft wrap out to uh, the traditional owners and say, oh, what do you think? And in many ways, it's like that's where and a lot of the traditional owners I work with say I, that really frustrates them because it's like they haven't been, there hasn't been any consultation, there hasn't been any process of intention or anything like that. It's just like this, you know, and, and it's almost forgetting who we're reconciling with or who we're con reconciling, you know, we're going through that process with. So, um, Nicole, AJ. <laughs> that's what I was going to say as well. Can, there are traditional owner groups 
apps that we're hearing feedback back, back at the moment going, we're just overwhelmed. We cannot do this. Is this, can you just explain to people maybe that if they're getting a consultant in or how, what questions they might need to ask the consultant to make sure they're, they're appropriate to be able to carry this process on? Because there are consultants that actually do work really well with traditional owners and there's others that have probably got no contact with traditional owners and... Yeah. I mean, the thing about if you, I absolutely adore the rap consultants who are out there. And, and the one thing that we really hope that happens in the process is a little bit of that capacity building with staff as well. So that staff need to be in that journey with, with the consultant in, you know, that engagement with the TOs. Because otherwise what you get is this, you know, perfectly written document that um, then can, can sit on the shelf. And then what you will often hear from community and even, um, you know, non-Indigenous people in the organisation, they'll say our rap never really had any cultural change or created any cultural change in our organization because we weren't really part of that relationship building process so it's not necessarily about having that you know lovely looking booklet or anything like that it's it all comes down to the relationship strengthening and exactly what you said though um aj in you know a lot of the the tos are saying we can't we can't be consulted on everything so that's why I say at that starting point sitting around the table if you are simply going into um, a, the traditional owner group that you're meeting with you you may simply set up quarterly meetings and that's what we do as an investment on any wrap is that we bed down maybe once or twice a year where we meet with auntie elders and we have an hour consultation. And again, this goes into your wrap budget where you sit down and you're actually able to say, you know, we're in the drafting process or this is our, these are our project managers, our wrap project managers who will be working on it. This is our wrap champion. These are, um, you know, some of the, this is our, our reconciliation vision that we're, we're doing and just parting with a bit of that information in that's your, that could be your first hour. And then you might come back in, you know, three or four months time and you might have made more of your relationships with your first people's partners or your advisory committee. You might have made some more progress and then you do a bit more of the sharing. But the idea is about, you know, having that, that sharing process. Not, not everybody um, is a large organisation and has the luxury of going, oh, okay, well, we can pay for consultations. And also, as you said, you know, the traditional owner groups, they're, there's really small families and small members of people trying to service thousands and thousands of RAP organisations and people out there. So it is a little bit about, you know, the first people's partners that you have around your organisation and a part of your organisation footprint, really working uh, working with those partners. Great question, Marie. So what about the timelines in a RAP? Yes. And so it, depending on how long because you know with a wrap your, your first wrap is a reflect wrap it's one year it's 12 months what I said we always say to organizations that's about business modeling it's just simply about getting your foundation and your vision it's about working out where does this plan where is it going to fit across our whole organization who, which um, staff and team members will have carriage of this who will coordinate and be part of the project project reporting and, you know, um, supporting uh, the, the governance and bringing the RAP working group together. That's all the foundational work that happens in the Reflect RAP. And then your second RAP is an Innovate RAP for two years. And that's when you start, you know, being able to flesh out, oh, we've got bigger deliverables like an Aboriginal employment strategy or a cultural learning strategy or an Aboriginal procure procurement framework. How will we do this? And again, and you start mapping out what would that framework look like? Which Aboriginal consultants will we engage and experts and partners will we bring around this? Which staff want to be part of this and build capacity in this area? Again, it's foundation setting in the innovate stage. And then when you get into that stretch stage, that's when you start building it. That's when you start actually doing it. The thing that the 
problem that we see and then so then you elevate your stretch is then going for um it's two and a half or three years on stretch and then elevate I think is longer again so but two years for innovate the the key thing that we we always see is people get overexcited when they're doing the reflect wrap and they come and they go oh we've got this great document and we booklet and we've done it all and it's like but you didn't have to do it all you've you know you've sped through it all we've we've got this sort of compliance rush 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 and we want to have this perfect package but it's actually just about strengthening the relationships that we're doing and foundation setting so that we actually really do focus on that cultural learning journey that relationship strengthening so that the first people's partners that we we are working with can support us in that cultural learning journey and having it long term and then effectively, when you get past Elevate, you should be able to take your, your, your uh, wheels off and uh, you, you'll have strong enough partners that you won't need a wrap anymore. <laughs> hey, Nicole, just um, two points that's got raised then is that um, early childhoods don't go through Nungar or what? Narragana Wally, yeah. So the wrap the stretch and the reflector are a little bit different. Oh, right, yeah. So they go through with Narragunna Wally. I think it's a year that they're doing with Nar they and they renew it every year with Narragunna Wally. Um, so that's that would have been that comment earlier today is that um, from the worker saying we renew every year. Yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, the Narragunna Wally program, I, I haven't had a lot to do with Narragunna Wally because it's a Rec Australia model, um, but it is a, like it's a renewal each year. And, I mean, I guess if, is, if there's somebody with us who is in, has been developing consecutive Narragunna Wallys, would they be able to sort of share their experience and perhaps I can talk to that? Anybody open? I haven't put you to sleep, have I? I hope not. <laughs> One other question we've got up here. What would happen in a situation, for example, if a large percentage of the organisation wishes to commence a RAP, but a small percentage of individuals are not on board with the RAP? Can the organisation still implement the RAP? Yeah, absolutely. Because it's about if you've got obstructors and, you know, people who just who want to obstruct it, depending on whether they you've got to kind of figure out again, this is because it's a cultural safety issue as well. If you've got people who are uh, deliberately obstructing or um, and so it's figuring out well, where where do they sit in the organization are they sitting in managerial levels are they sitting at the, at the top of the organization or at the front of the organization and that's when we come down to doing that cultural self-reflection assessment of the whole organization because you'll be surprised how many how many organize how many people will actually safely say I i'm not really that interested in developing a rap or i'm not really that interested in doing this work why are we doing this work and that's where you, you are it, it provides that little bit of openness and honesty about well, where are pockets of um, potential uns, you know safe places in your organization and we we run those absolutely first and foremost before um, developing a wrap because we need to know where those um, unsafe places are and maybe do some of that targeted training have that conversation with the organization um, and you know yeah, dig into it a little bit. Yep, go uh, for it. Would you, would you say there's a difference between implementing a wrap and developing a wrap? Because I would go yes, developing wrap. Developing a wrap is a process in itself. Yep. And then implementing a wrap is a completely different process. Absolutely. And those timelines that um, I talked to with, with Marie's question about, you know, one year, two years, three and four, that is simply um, the implementation timelines. The development timeline could be two or three. So if an organisation says to me, oh, can you write me a wrap in three months? I say I could, but I won't. So that's the implementation. The implementation is... Um, you know, four stages of consultation. Try and do your consultation as, as well as you can in that time because it gives you all the pieces of what you want to do in there. It gives you that business modelling that you want to do. And we do it with so many other parcels of our work and it, it makes it so enjoyable. It builds the participation. And when you get into that implementation stage, that's that one year and two year. But, and that's where you start to 
um, track and measure. You know, AJ, you said to me um, in coming into this conversation about how do we track and measure our, our rat, rat progress. So with um, Narragunawali, it might be a little bit different, but for um, if you've got uh, the ones over one year or two year with uh, Innovate, you will do quarterly um, rap reporting within your organisation and then you'll do also public reporting outside of your organisation and you'll fill out an annual barometer survey as well. Um, but really, it's, it's really important. I think the reporting part is actually the bit where you build success and you promote your success about your, you know, your relationships and how everything's working. And it actually motivates everyone in the organization to feel like, oh, I want to be part of this. What, you know, oh, that's great. And, you know, really like, like we, we celebrate success with so many other things that we do. But the other thing about reporting really well in with your RAP, it actually supports the organisation to learn how to write and communicate on content relating to First Peoples. And you, you know, AJ, this yourself, is that how many organisations you come across that, you know, their competency or confidence is so low in actually reporting on, you know, First Peoples content. And the RAP reporting um, process gives you a real opportunity to build capacity across the whole organisation on, you know, or, yeah, on, on how you, you celebrate the success and report on the success of your partnerships, your relationships, that cultural content. Um, yeah. Someone just put up a good question there. Developing a RAP takes a long time. I always say to people that when you're developing a RAP, a RAP is really like a capability statement. What, what are we able to do? So stop for a second and go, well, what are we able to do? If, if we had as much, if we were able to do something in the next three years, what would we want to achieve? Yeah. And are we capable of doing that? And our rap, you know, it shouldn't take too long to write a rap, but it's still a process. So most organisations I work with, when I do consultancy, we take about nine months to write the rap because yeah. it's part of the process. But then this is, that's enough time to do enough consultation, enough time for the internal organisation to go, this is what we want to achieve. Yep. And then we get it stamped off by Reconciliation Australia. And then after that, it's about, well, now we need to be able to demonstrate to the community that we've promised that we're going to achieve this stuff, how we're going to actually do this. And that's the implementation. And I think, you know, one thing that I've, I've tried to encourage people to do is that even though you have the prescribed deliverables and actions which are then handed down from, from RA, I, I always invite organisations to instead listen to their staff and first people on the, those wish lists of, you know, what you find when we do that um, really great First Peoples consultation at the beginning of the development of your RAP and then you take those that wish list to your staff, staff often will say, oh, thank goodness, I've been waiting forever to be able to do these deliverables. And what we find is that then from those wish lists from your staff and, your, um, and the consultation you've done with First Peoples, then you start to find the threads of the, that wish list in the language and then embed it into the language of those prescribed deliverables. But don't stick, don't stick to the language that's in those deliverables. Otherwise, you just end up with this really bog standard rap that's just like, oh, we just tick, tick, tick the box. And, you know, lots of people find the tick the box raps really, you know, not very, uh, they don't feel very meaningful. Um, and so, yes, so it's one thing is just to try and I, when I'm doing a wrap, I actually keep the prescribed deliverables over there in the corner. I don't even engage with those while I'm asking community what their what their wish lists are. I keep it out of the because I know that I can always I bring them back in. I'll bring that content in, but not at the beginning. No. Yeah, I, I've found when um, I've been helping a number of schools do ones at the moment and it's really hard sometimes to contain because all of a sudden they start to, this is what we want and this is what we want and, they go, and they're over consulting. And I have to pull them back together and go, stop over consulting. Yeah. We want to get this capability statement, this wrap in place so that you can do some of this stuff that you're 
that you're dreaming of and wanting to do. And I'm not downplaying any of your ambitions, but you need to have the framework in place so that you can actually do it. Yeah. So you need to actually get these deliverables signed off by Reconciliation Australia yeah. so that we can actually do the implementation of it. Because That's a great... That is a great point. And so with that wish list, you have to put, yeah, you have to be realistic and from your organisation's capability. So you almost do, you have to say at the beginning in your consultations, there are things that we aren't going to be able to get to. We One, we won't be able to afford, we don't have enough staff to be able to do that. So you do have to put all those reality points in that consultation so that you curb it in and you do have that, you, you will end up with, you know, a, some, a, a fairly long list, but you've got to be able to be really clear in that consultation to everybody that we, we're not, we may not get it all done in this, this first draft, but we're going to keep all these consultation notes and we're going to make sure that we don't have to, you know, come back to this table. If we've got gold in that list, we'll come back and we'll do that in our innovate wrap. You know, we'll do that in our next our stretch wrap. So I, I just make sure that I do take, you, you do keep the reality check in there, but you certainly, um, and the same goes for the staff. Staff can get very ambitious too. But um, that, that's okay. It's better than having no ambition at all. <laughs> I'm just going to throw it open to anybody because we've got to wind up very shortly. But any questions straight to Nicole, like that you want to not put into the chat, but actually ask Nicole directly. Yeah, thanks, Lynette. Yes, I have a question. Yeah. Um, Nicole. Um, Nicole, can you talk a little bit about the seven pillars you mentioned? Yes, absolutely. Of the of the VELG strategy. Yes. Yes, I can because this is my VELG strategy here, and you can see how dog-eared it is. Because I am just crazy when it comes to this <laughs> content, as AJ knows. So I will tell you those seven pillars. The um the first one is culture, respect, and trust. The second pillar is awareness and engagement. The third pillar is accountability and direction. The fourth pillar is governance and participation. The fifth pillar is economic participation. And the sixth, the sixth one is health and well-being. And then the seventh is resourcing and funding. Um, so they are absolutely going to be um, about with how the pillars of those self-determination local action plans are, they, those pillars, pill, uh, pillars will be closely, um, the, the form the key structure for those local action plans. But I, um, I'm happy to send that link for that Victorian Aboriginal and local government strategy. You'll see it all in there. Um, I'll provide Great. that. Yeah. Appreciate that. So, uh, yep. Everyone, every, what normally will happen, Nicole will send it to us. We'll put it as a link on the Reconciliation uh, web page, Reconciliation Series web page, where the, the last number of Reconciliation things or web, webinars are already uploaded to there. Yeah. Decided not to put stuff into the chat because people don't have time, can't have trouble cutting and pasting. Some people can't see the chat very well. It will all go onto our, onto the uh, Reconciliation web page. Yeah. And it's got some, you know, beautiful stuff in there, like um, the 11 self-determination principles. Like one of the key things we often get asked from local governments is please can you put, you know, self-determination into our, our wrap, please, you know, thread it in there. And then I say to them, well, what is self-determination to you? And the conversation just falls flat quickly. They don't, that, or they'll have a perception of what self-determination means to them, but actually not self-determination through a first people's lens. And I think that that's really critically important. AJ's nodding. And so, yeah, you could probably do a whole other session on that, AJ, <laughs> or have. Someone said, where do we buy the book? You can't buy the book. It's it's downloadable. We'll I'll get you the link for yeah. it. The other, the other great, Great webinar. We've been doing a lot of um, webinars for educators um, on a monthly basis. And the last one we did was with uh, Dr. Lois Peeler, Arnie Lois from uh, up at the Warrawa 
college in Aboriginal college in Healesville. I'm not sure if you've had her as a guest before, AJ, but um, trying, at, we're trying to negotiate with her for the October one. She's amazing. And if you haven't had a deep dive into the resource that she did in partnership with the Parliament of Victoria. The resources focused on year seven, eights and nines, but I would say it is applicable to all of us and it's called Aboriginal Change Makers. And it is just such a deep dive. You can go layer, 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 layer and still, you know, keep going back for more. This, she's poured, poured her absolute heart into that and and really I guess we we did put a um, um her name is Dr Lois Peeler P-E-E-L-E-R -E -E but the resource is Aboriginal Change Makers mm. yeah and it's online and it's free so if you're looking for a free um professional development toolkit even for staff to have a little um dig into just yeah that it's something that I've asked my staff again to do as a PD for themselves just to have have a little bit of whenever they want to have a um, dive into something just to to pick up a new topic yeah oh thank uh, you Nicole. guys it's, it's coming towards the end of the the one hour yeah. um I could talk to, or to Nicole for hours and I think Nicole and I've spoken on the phone for hours <laughs> uh, uh, at different times. But I do want to thank Nicole for um, hanging out with us th this evening and talking to us about Reconciliation Australia. Oh, Victoria. Uh, Victoria. Oh, Victoria. Sorry, Reconciliation Local. Victoria. Yeah. Local people, local place and purpose. And, you know, if you want to get to the mi our micro groups, as I said, there will be a local rec group in your neighbourhood. So the other group that we're working really closely with this year, AJ, and um, the Aboriginal gathering places. So there's 17 Aboriginal gathering places across Victoria. And in terms of places where self-determination is really unfolding, vital services for Aboriginal community and really safe places for Aboriginal community to engage with, um, with non-Indigenous people through the, the lens, the protocols and principles that um, and, and the services that they're delivering. Um, we, we're doing a very specific project this year um, focusing and doing a whole community profiling project on Aboriginal gathering places. So keep an eye on Rec Vic's website as well as our Magali website for more info about that. Cool. Now, thanks, guys. As usual, these will be uploaded to our the reconciliation um, page on Ajax. Please let all your colleagues know where the uh, where they're all uploaded to. We have got another. This is uh, number six. We've got another six more coming during the year. The next three, I'm not sure the order because I just don't have them right sitting in front of me. We have got the grandmothers against removal coming in to talk. We have got the Koori education officers, and we've got the Koori maternity strategy uh, to talk about. So some really quite interesting things. The whole purpose of this particular series, this first series, is that when we're enrolling an Aboriginal child into our early childhood centre, we're not actually enrolling the child, we're enrolling the whole family. Indeed. And it's so important to give you a background of exactly where these families are, where they're kind of placed in history, their experiences, the policy behind exactly some of the issues that they face. Uh, number, I know number 11, uh, workshop 10, we are looking at Torres Strait Islander uh, perspectives and how to start to implement that into curriculum. In number 11 is the, the how to start implementing Aboriginal strategies into uh, curriculum. Mm -hmm. And we've got a really, hour and a half one in December which is a big uh, a, a little bit of an overview of what we've covered but we do actually have some great guest speakers we've got Ani Dai coming to her welcome to country we've got a we've got some sing we've got a singer we've got a dig player we've got um, a comedian to wrap up the, the final of the series Aww. so we're actually halfway through the series and I just want to say thank you all for joining. I can see the same, some familiar faces each time. It's really grateful that you keep coming back in. It's also really important to try to get your colleagues to come in and try to get them to understand the framework. 
I've had a couple of emails sent to me going, I don't understand how this relates to the work I'm actually doing right now. And just, just want to remind everyone, it's about putting the framework behind why we do need to start making changes in our practice. It's about understanding why we need reconciliation action plans, why we actually need to be able to understand Aboriginal people and the trauma that they might face. Where does this come from? How can we actually make changes? Just jumping forward to next year, we will be having three, possibly four workshops that is going to be specifically around implementation to curriculum. So this first year was really about giving you the framework behind the families that you'll be working with to lead into uh, more curriculum design, uh, which will be coming in, in next year in 2023, which I've already started working on as well. So guys, thank you again. Please thank Nicole for um, joining us today. Um, guys. Yeah, uh, have the cameras on. You can't, hear the <laughs> you can't hear the. Absolutely love your work, AJ. Thank you for being awesome, and I can't wait. I hope you invite me back for the other um, events so I can listen in. Uh, well, I'll give you all the dates, no problem. So, guys, thank you very much for joining us. We're back again next month with um, an, an, a next workshop, and I'll have a great night, guys. Thank you. Brilliant. Bye, guys. Thank you.